Good afternoon. This is Fire, but Black Press USA. Uh, today we have Denny Davis, the congressman from the seventh district from Illinois. He has been reelected by large majority since 1996. In the 116th Congress, uh, Representative Davis has been reappointed to the powerful Ways and Means Committee, and he has distinguished himself as an articulate voice for his constituents and as an effective legislator able to move major bills to passage. Representative Davis is resolutely committed to preserving democracy, protecting Social Security, maintaining the nation's gains in civil and human rights, as well as women's rights, voting rights, and protection of the environment. Welcome, Congressman Davis. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, you know, my pleasure. son's name is Stacy. So, um, <laughs> hey, that, that's a real treat. Uh, hey, what can we say, right? <laughs> Congressman, um, a lot's going on. Uh, lots going on in Washington, as we know. Uh, lots going on there in Illinois. In fact, uh, Prior to going on the air, we we talked a little bit about the um, uprisings and and the disturbances that's been happening. Maybe we start there for a moment uh, before we move to Washington. Uh, give us an update on what's happening there in Chicago and 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 throughout actually the state. Well, you know, it kind of caught some of us, many of us, by surprise in terms of the most recent flurry of activity, but unemployment among African-American males in Chicago and in the inner city is so high until any time there's an opportunity for individuals to get sidetracked a little bit, they're more likely to do it because the unemployment jobs that exist in the area by and large have been outside the city limits where African-Americans do not live. And so even when there are jobs, uh, accessing them, getting to them becomes a problem. And so we do have that problem. Much of Chicago, that is Black Chicago, are people who migrated from the rural South, as I did. And, and many of those individuals' families ended up having a hard time holding on to their ways of life for their children because they were new and different environments. But, but you know, we've got issues. We, we've got problems. Yeah. <laughs> we've got <laughs> needs. <laughs> well, who doesn't, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so... Um, so now let's let's talk about what's what's happening in Washington. Um, the negotiations have stopped uh, for the um, heroes uh, package. We know that the the last we understood it, they were at least a trillion dollars apart. The Republicans and Democrats, and and then the president issued some executive orders that many say have uh, almost no teeth, if any teeth. Um, what's the latest, Congressman? Well, you know, I agree with the individuals who are saying that. And I don't necessarily just beat up on the president because I disagree with 95% of everything that, that he generally comes up with. But the reality is the HEROES Act that we passed more than a couple months ago is an excellent piece of legislation. I, I mean, it really is. No, no pun intended. I mean, I think we outdid ourselves on it. I mean, when we passed it in the House, I said to myself, this is a great way to approach stimulus relief. This is a great way to keep some money flowing into the pockets and the hands of low-income working people. This is a way to address the coronavirus. And, and so there it is. It gets over to the Senate. And of course, uh, Mitch says, hey, DOA, dead on arrival. We're not going to even consider this. It has less chance of passing 
than a snowball has existed in hell. And so that's pretty much where it's been. Fortunately, they finally came around. I think after looking at the polls and as the president's approval ratings kept going down, they finally said, well, we better do something. So he comes up with this way out stuff of saying, well, I'm going to issue an executive order and we'll do some things with that. All the scholar, legal scholars that I've heard and even the economists that I've heard have suggested that this is flash and dash. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, it, that, that they're really, it, it's talking points. And yeah. of course, he is talking. I don't think it's real. I, don't, I think it's part of his political shenanigans. And it's designed to try and say, well, look, I tried to give you something. The Democrats didn't do that. There's a big difference between $1 trillion and $3 trillion. And, and so we're holding out. We've got a bold approach. People need $600. They need it in order to survive. They need rent relief. They need mortgage help. They need all of the things that we put in the HEROES Act. And, um, you know, we're, we're not caving in. Yeah. We're not caving in right now. Yeah, Congressman Davis, you mentioned the $600. That is the federal um, addition to state unemployment. And uh, what have you seen or what have you heard from your constituents about that additional $600? Um, it ended uh, two weeks ago now, about two weeks ago. Um, how bad are, are people hurting? Let me tell you, the $600 is like manna from heaven. I'm, I'm saying this, this phony notion that the Republicans have been trying to push, saying that people won't go back to work because $600 is more than many people would be earning if they were working. If the individuals wouldn't go back to work, of course, they wouldn't be eligible for unemployment. So that's a big lie in the first place. I, I, I mean, that's just not real. It's not honest. It's intellectually dishonest. People love it because it gives them a sense of dignity. I mean, a guy, a lady, or a family can pay their rent. They don't have to stand in line to ask someone to give them food. And so they can operate knowing that their government has their interest in mind and is taking care of them. And so we have no choice but to hold on and, and fight and fight for people to get enough help that it does some good. And uh, Congressman, I, I'm not sure if you were aware of the um, sarcasm uh, from Senator Ted Cruz um, yesterday when it came to um, this these negotiations. Uh, he uh, tweeted that, uh, why not give everybody a million dollars and a latte? Um, and he was obviously being sarcastic, but a lot of people were offended by that, saying that um, it represent is representative of what the Republicans have um, have have done. They viewed this as pretty much something just to laugh about. Well, and they have every right to view it as sarcasm. They they have every right to be offended because everybody know that if you cannot work if you can't safely do what it is that you've been doing, or you don't have any way for your children to be cared for, you don't have an elder family member or someone who can take care of a child, you can't leave them. I, I, I mean, you got an eight-month-old baby. You can't just leave that child 
anywhere. You can't leave a two-year-old or three-year-old. No, I think the difference is, is, is in values and the way that we see them. If you can find a way to provide relief and, and help for the wealthiest people in the country, and you can't find a way for the masses who represent the greatest amount of need, then your priorities are out of line. And I think that the priorities of the Republican leaders is definitely out of line. Yeah, and Congressman Davis, um, uh, give us a sense of the impact that the end of the, the $600 of unemployment support has on tenant evictions in Chicago and surrounding areas. Well, let me tell you, the $600, either way you cut it, people who get that money, we talk about reopening the economy. We talk about lifting up the economic condition. All of that money is going to go right back into the economy. It's going to go right back into the environment. People are going to go to the grocery store. They're going to pay their rent. They're going to pay the mortgage. They're going to go and get a haircut. They're going to go to the beauty shop. They, they, they're going to pay for child care if they can get it. They're going to put all of that money right back into the economy. And unless my theories and notions about economic development and economic reality, when you put that money back into the economy, you've got the give and take, you've got the movement of money, it is circulating, and that's good for the economy, and it makes a lot of sense to do it. And to not have it, people will be climbing up against the wall. What am I going to do? Yeah, Congressman Davis, um you know, the census uh, is a big deal. Uh, this is a, the 2020 census. And we uh, also know that they have decided to cut the count short. Uh, they're going to end it next month. Um, t can you talk about that and, and how crucial it is that everyone is counted? Well, you know, for people who don't know it, I even tell them, you know, you go all the way back in the Bible <laughs> and Moses is, started taking the census. I mean, it's not new. I mean, there's always been a need to know who the people are, how many of them you have, the different kinds of people who exist. You know, we say that you're going to get between fourteen dollars and $1,800 per person, provided that these individuals are counted for 10 years, that that money will come into one's community for schools, for roads, for bridges, for libraries, for health care, for every kind of thing. But if you're not counted, then it means that you don't count. And, and so we're crusading. I'm actually going into those areas with the lowest returns, knocking on people's doors, jumping off of a bus that uh, one of our agencies has a bus. We're going to ride with volunteers and jump out and run, knock on the door and ask, "Are you? have you filled out the form? Please fill it out. Yeah. Please make absolutely sure and put everybody in the household, everybody that was, don't miss the children. I mean, can you imagine a family with four or five people in it and you're not filling that information out? That's a lot of money that yeah. you don't get. And of course it has to do with redistricting, reapportionment, all of those valuable things. I mean, even if you don't believe in government, fill out the census form anyhow. 
so that somebody else can have the benefit of the money that will come to the neighborhood and to the community. So education around census return is indeed a big factor. And we think that, uh, you know, you got to be careful because the other guys use all of the shenanigans that they can use. They don't want to keep the postal service operating. They won't put any money. You know, the postal service has been here since the Pony Express. And, 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 and it's gotten everybody their mail. And uh, the president had said earlier, well, we don't think we put any money into that. And actually, there have been efforts to destabilize postal operations for many years now. And it's finally at the point where it's on the verge of collapse. And we got to do something. Look at all the men and women who have decent jobs working in postal operations. If we let this disintegrate, they are out of work. And then they come back working for less than what they currently earn. So we just got a lot of things on the agenda that we've got to pay serious attention to. Yeah, we are uh, talking with Congressman Danny Davis of Illinois. This is FIRE, uh, Black Press USA. Um, Congressman, a couple of comments from, from our viewers um, un posting under the name The Real uh, Diva Mom. The Republicans are completely disconnected from the real needs of their own constituents. People need help. And then Annette Phillips, who is one of our regular viewers, uh, we always appreciate Annette. She says she was getting the $600. It was less than 70% of, uh, of her income. And, and, and one other thing, Congressman, last week we had a great um, interview with Tom Steyer, the businessman, and Rep. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. And we know Sheila Jackson Lee is um, champion HR 40, reparations for uh, uh, the slavery. And What's your thoughts on that HR 40? Uh, fr uh, free Freedom Train is asking that question. Will Congressman Davis support the edited version of the HR 40? Let me tell you, the first thing I signed on to when I first was elected to Congress, John Conyers has had the bill uh, since the beginning of time. Uh, plus, it just happened that when I went to Congress, I had uh, worked on the divestment bill ordinance that we had in the city of Chicago when we stopped doing business with entities that were involved with apartheid in South Africa. So my history in terms of supporting reparations has been long standing, and I will be supporting reparations until the end of time. <laughs> <laughs> It's not well, even, with me, it's not even an issue. It's not a question. Yeah. It's automatic. It, it's, it's when you really look at what slavery has done to African-Americans in this country, I happen to have been a history major in undergraduate school. And, and, and so I've been reading about slavery since I was five or six years old. And, and, and so if we need anything, we need to repair some of the damn, oh, it was a horrible, horrible uh, uh, institution yeah. that, 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 that you can't describe what it has done. So I'm all in with reparations. <laughs> Well, you know, going back a, a moment, um, Congressman, uh, you're talking about the census. Why do you feel that uh, the potential impact of so many of these important issues like the census often fail to resonate with African-Americans? Well, I think a part of the problem is that we in some of our school districts don't really teach civics or citizenship or don't put as much emphasis on these subject matter areas as I think we should. 
And I certainly agree that people need to know how to get a job and they need to have a skill or they need to have some skills, things that they can do. But it's also important to understand that the role of citizenship, I mean, we, we have all these different titles. There's no title in a free and democratic society that is more important than that of citizenship. And so it's a citizenship right, but it's also a citizenship responsibility. We have the responsibility to be an intricate part of the environment in which we live. And if we don't do that, as far as I'm concerned, we are abdicating part of our citizenship responsibility. Uh, Congressman, today the um, Democratic um, uh, National Committee announced the um, convention uh, lineup, the, the speakers. And on Thursday, uh, the, the, the closing day of the um, convention, of course, um, Vice President Biden will accept the nomination formally. But two other speakers are listed. That is uh, Senator Kamala Harris and Tammy Duckworth. They are uh, often mentioned as front runners for the um, to join him on the ticket. Does does their inclusion on Thursday does does that signal that one of the two is going to get the nod? I don't think so. Um, you know, people make all kind of political decisions, but let me tell you, I've worked with both. They are both outstanding, inspirational leaders. I've worked with Tammy for a long time. I actually supported uh, Senator Harris um, for president during, during the campaign. Uh, she was my first choice. I don't think that necessarily means that they're going to be that either one of them. I'm certainly hoping and urging that an African-American woman be on the ticket for vice president. Um, you know, there was a poet who said, some folks see things that aren't ask why. And then he say, I like to dream of things that have never been and ask why not. Well, we've never had a woman that was going to get elected, and I think a woman can be elected vice president, and I think an African-American sister would just create so much uh, interest and, and inspire so many people and say, hey, Joe Biden really means what he's been saying, and uh, there's an expectation as well as a hope. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm expecting and I'm also hoping that there's going to be an African-American woman who becomes the running mate. Well, Congressman, how important is it that he picks the, the most qualified, the best qualified, or that he picks a woman of color? Not saying that a woman of color is not the best qualified. Well, let me tell you, qualification is like beauty. <laughs> it's in the eye of the beholder. I can't think of a person who has managed to get elected to high office to the level of United States Senator or to the House of Representatives uh, and not being qualified. And, and so I like individuals on the basis of the issues they promote and, and, and what they are likely to do when the situations are tough, you know, like in, in times of crisis and when it's tough. So I think there are a number of people who are seriously qualified. They just need the opportunity to demonstrate just how qualified they are. And, and so I'm with the deal. I'm 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 glad that we're talking about a female period and I'm hoping that it's going to be an African American woman 
uh, because I think that just speaks a great deal to our country in terms of where it's been and where I hope it's headed. You know, I asked Congressman um, Alcee Hastings of Florida uh, this question uh, yesterday. I asked him, uh, would he be disappointed if an African-American woman wasn't chosen? And, and he was very honest. He said he would be very disappointed. He said that he um, he would still support uh, uh, Biden, but his enthusiasm wouldn't quite be where it would if an African-American is running with him. Is that I think there are a number of African Americans who feel that way, and and you know the struggle that black people have experienced in this country, and in spite of all of that, are still believers, are still people who keep coming. I mean, I used to pick cotton. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of know what after slavery was about and, and how even after slavery had been, been outlawed, we almost went back to slavery in the South uh, with the election of 1876 when the deal was cut and, and, and the troops were pulled out and the sharecropping system and all of this stuff develops. And that's why I think we have to make sure that our young people know a great deal or as much as we can take the time to help them understand our history in this country and, and what is owed to us and what need to happen to pay the debt. Or, or, or to repair the breach, or to try to make real this concept of democracy and, and what democracy can really stand for. Yeah, and go, going back, uh, one of our um, viewers uh, is asking, and has asked a few times, and, and I will pose that question if you are aware of Dr. Darity's edits to HR 40. Does HR 40 needs Dr. Darity's uh, edits? Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm, that's I'm, that's as resounding as you get, right? <laughs> one of the reasons that I'm probably here is because I grew up learning to read and read a great deal as a child. I went to a one-room school where one teacher, Miss Beatty King, taught eight grades, plus what we call the little primer and the big primer, all by herself. And, and so the fact that I started reading and kept on reading <laughs> and kept on reading <laughs> kind of helped me learn a few things and understand a few things and recognize what I call self-interest in a certain kind of way. And, and, and so I'm always amazed when I consider people voting and taking on situations that are against their self-interest. I mean, when I look at African-American communities and can't find a soul food restaurant, you know, that, that bothers me. <laughs> I, mean, I, I consider that a, a disadvantage, not an advantage. And, and so I think they're just things that we have to do and we have to keep believing in ourselves, keep believing in each other. When you tell me something that Alcee Hastings said, you know, I have to smile and say, ah, Alcee said <laughs> right on. Alcee, down in Florida, doing the thing, been sick, but working every day. His mind is as clear as a bell, one of the most eloquent uh, spokespersons I've ever encountered or come into contact with. And so I like to see Alcee on the floor 
arguing his position and pushing his point. And I think that's what we have to do is be as unified as we can possibly be, be as supportive of each other as we can possibly be, and just know that King and all those guys was right. We shall overcome. <laughs> Takes and, a little while. <laughs> and Congressman, before we let you go, um, you talked about uh, so passionately about the young ones. Do you believe that young people who are out protesting uh, today are making a difference? I think unequivocally and without a doubt. And, and you know, it's kind of like you just got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm saying protest has its place. I am so glad that Black Lives Matter has emerged to the point many of the positions are the same as, as what we are experiencing today, but they didn't get the attention. They didn't get the play. They didn't get the escalation. So sometimes a certain protest will, 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 will bring something to light that just saying it another way won't be the same. You know, I'm saying, Guy said, John went across the river. Another guy said, and John, you know, he went. And, and that brings in attention. So all of the approaches that we can use need to be used and they need to be combined to make the difference. And that's what we are experiencing right now. And... Um Congressman, I know we are over time now. Last question, and then we will definitely let you go. Um, we, um, we know that the elections are coming. We, we, we talked about the census. How important is it for, black pre for the black press of America to continue to get the message out um, from the Congressional Black Caucus? Well, let me tell you, the National Newspaper Publishers Association, the Crusader here in Chicago, the Chicago Daily Defender, the Citizen, all of these have been guiding lights for me personally and have contributed so much till, till you, you, without it, uh, I used to go down to a lady's house when I was a kid because every once in a while there would be a Pittsburgh courier laying around there or somebody would get off the train and bring a defender, and uh, I'd pretend that I was down there to help her out, but I was really there because I'd get a chance to read those papers. And, and so the black press has been a hallmark and a guiding light, the North Star, if you will, for our movement, for our education, for our enlightenment, and we couldn't do without it. Well, Congressman uh, Davis, we really, really appreciate you taking out the time this afternoon. Uh, we invite everyone to tune in tomorrow. We'll have um, Congressman Dwight Evans from Pennsylvania joining us as we continue to talk to members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Dwight and I and, serve on the same committee and subcommittee, so I'll be looking for him. <laughs> All right. Very good. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Congressman Special thanks to you and everybody stay safe and stay well. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much.